scheduled, and I was asked to speak to you about a Jew at Christmas. I think the program producers had in mind some kind of amiable and perhaps mildly witty chat, consonant with the general conception of the spirit of Christmas, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, a sort of verbal Christmas card. But peace, if it is at all coming to my area, still has a long and rocky road to travel. And speaking for myself, which is what I'm supposed to do, I'm not busting out all over with indiscriminate goodwill toward men. And after all, I've been asked to talk to you about a Jew at Christmas. Not Jews at Christmas, a Jew, me. If I speak with some passion, well, that's how I feel, and I intend to be candid. This mixture of passion and candor risks unintended offense. If I should offend any of you, I ask your forbearance, in the spirit of Christmas, of course. In the years before 1967, whenever I was in Jerusalem at Christmas Eve, I would drive to Kibbutz Ramat Rachel at the southern rim of the Jewish sector in the then divided city. I'd climb to the top of the Kibbutz water tower, pockmarked and scarred by bullets and shells of the first, the 1948 Arab-Israel War, and gaze across the night-dark valley at the long, long serpentine of cars, silent in the distance, their dimmed headlights like linked and loosened jewels, threading slowly along the winding road through that part of the Judean hills that was then Jordanian territory. At a bend in the road, dominating the road and the valley below, loomed the brooding ramparts of Mar Elias Monastery, the thin occasional glitter of the gun barrels of the Jordanian Arab legionnaires signaling fear and menace from the monastery walls, the very presence of armed men offending that moment in that place. And above it all, the sheen of light against the night sky reflecting from a source cupped in the hills, hidden, unseen, unseeable, unreachable for a Jew, Bethlehem, the birthplace of another Jew who became the Prince of Peace. During all those years, from war to war to war, from 1948 to 1967, no Jew could go from Israeli territory to Bethlehem. Well, hell, no Jew could even cross the thin stretch of encircling no man's land that tore Jerusalem in two, Jewish sector, Arab sector, with the Arabs holding the holy old city where stands the Western Wall, the famed Wailing Wall, whose stones, they say, weep for the centuries of Jewish torment, all that remains of the temple destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, rebuilt by the Jews after the Babylonian exile and destroyed again by the Romans under Titus. From 1948 to 1967, we could not go to our single most sacred shrine. So what matter then that we could not go to Bethlehem, to your Christian place? And yet it mattered. For he was Joshua before he was Jesus, he was ours before he was yours, and a teacher among us before he became your Savior and your Christ. And if we cast him out and denied his divinity then and deny it still, as so we must, being Jews, well, what have you Christians done, most of you, many of you, but embrace the shadow and deny the substance? Would Christ have done to his Jewish people in his time on earth what you Christians ever since have done in his name to mine through all the centuries since Christ was born in Bethlehem? By my God! And with humility, it sometimes seems to me that Christ means more to me than he does to many of you who bend the knee and speak the name. And therefore, Christmas has meaning for me. And therefore, as it was an enormity that armed men through those two decades barred my way to my most sacred shrine and that this touched you little and grieved you not at all, so also it was an offense that these same armed men through those same years barred me from the visit, yes, even the pilgrimage that I wished to make to your holy place, and that you permitted this also, and also gave it no heed, is shameful. I claim no special gifts for my people, 
except perhaps that special endurance that is oppression's harsh gift. But I would point out to you that in the decades since the 1967 war, in these years that the Jewish state has held all the Holy Land, no such offense has been done to Christian or Muslim or to any other person because of his faith. Don't mistake my meaning. I do not speak for the Israeli military occupation of Arab land since 1967. All occupying powers do wrong, and military occupations are at all justifiable, and that justification is limited only within the categorical imperative of national survival. I say only that under the Israeli occupation, no holy place is barred to any persons who wish to come in reverence, in respect, in peace. This sin we Jews have not done. I have said that Christmas has meaning for me. It was not always so. It became so when I became a Jew for the second time. Let me speak of this. I was born and lived as a child in New York's East Side District among Jews, most of whom had come in the years just before World War I, fleeing the pogroms and persecutions of Eastern Europe, seeking the compassionate promise of the free and golden land. There weren't any Christians where I lived, or if there were, I never met them. The world was Jewish. The language in the homes, in the shops, in the streets was Yiddish. Until I was eight and my family moved out of that loud and lusty and vivid and reeking slum to a rickety flat on Broadway and 87th Street, the west side of New York, we thereby bettered ourselves, except that my mother and father became shadowy figures absentee parents out of the flat at dawn and bent all day over sewing machines and steam irons in a stinking sweatshop in the garment district making pretty clothes for others to wear and we my older brothers and i became schlissel kinder door key kids brawling in the schools and prowling in the streets ill-fed and savage marked as poor by the rags we wore and the keys to our homes strung around our necks it was there that I learned that it is shameful to be ragged and a sin to be poor. The Christian kids taught us that and learned from their parents to call us kikes and Christ killers. And when the Great Depression devastated America and everyone was poor, we still in this neighborhood, which was the whole world, were pariahs, the poorest, and Jews. The world was suddenly Christian, and in that world I learned a lot. I learned camouflage. If you can't fight them, join them. Oh, I could fight. I was tough enough and tricky enough, but there were too many of them and too few of me, and you can't fight all the time. The thing to do, I learned, is join them. And I remember exactly when and how the lesson was learned. It was the morning of Christmas Eve, 1925, a month before my ninth birthday. It was very cold. Snow lay on the ground, turning to ice. My parents were at work, my brothers somewhere. I wrapped newspapers around me under my sweater to keep me warm, and I stuffed cardboard into my shoes where the soles were nearly worn through. And I walked the 53 blocks, almost three miles, to Macy's department store on 34th Street. There I stood for, I remember it as a couple of hours, in a long queue outside the building with hundreds of other kids, most of them with their parents, until we inched into the building and moved along the queue inside and came finally to Santa Claus. Oh, I suppose I knew even then that he was just a man with a phony white beard and a pillow stuffed into his red costume. But when you're a kid, there's a difference between what you know and what you really know. My turn came. I stepped up on the platform and leaned close to him in his high chair and started to tell Santa Claus, as one was supposed to do, what presents I wanted for Christmas. Santa opened his mouth, and the man whispered, This ain't for you, Jew boy. Go to your rabbi. I spat at him. And he knocked me off the platform, and I fell among the other kids, and they began kicking me until the parents hauled me up, and the store police came and hustled me out of the building, and I ran along the freezing streets crying, a Jewish kid in a Christian world at Christmas time. That's when I learned to join them. I couldn't become a Christian, but I could become less Jewish. 
I quit the cheder, the school for teaching children the basics of Jewish religion that my parents sent me to three evenings a week, scrimping and going hungry themselves to pay for it. I quit that. I stopped going to synagogue on the high holy days. I sat mute and without head covering at the table on Friday nights when my mother lit the candles to welcome the Sabbath. I refused to speak Yiddish at home and screamed at my parents for doing so. Be American, I yelled. Americans speak English, English, not Yiddish. And so I lost that flowing and beautiful language as I lost or abandoned the rest of my Jewish heritage. It happens all the time, of course, and not only to Jews. It happens to the children of immigrants everywhere. It happens to every minority under pressure of a dominant culture. I know that now. I didn't then. Then it was happening to me and my brothers, and we were kids. In the years that followed, I lived and clawed my way to some success in the Christian world. I distanced myself from Judaism, from the religion, from the culture, the history, from everything that gave meaning to being a Jew. The process of doing so took a long time, and every now and again there were failures, moments of unease, some clutch of identification. But as the years went by, these moments became fewer, became atavisms, stirrings of some primal memory, vague and easily ignored. The Jewish holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Passover, the great Jewish days of awe were not in my calendar then. Your holidays were, and chief among these, Christmas. Oh, I didn't celebrate the birth of Christ at Christmas time, but then neither did most of my Christian friends. For them, Christmas was a warm and friendly and joyful occasion, and so it was for me. There wasn't much place in all that hectic happiness for reverence. The Christmas carols weren't religious, weren't Christian. They were lilting folk songs, which I sang as loudly as my Christian friends and with a better memory for the words, the less for the tune. What I'm saying is that in those years when I was not a Jew, Christmas had for me what it had for most of my Christian friends and has for them still. I think I began to become aware of the import of Christmas on the day that I began to become once again a Jew. I can date that exactly, day and place. It was April 24th, 1945, at the Nazi concentration camp at Dachau, near Munich, in Germany. I was an American soldier then, and we came into that dreadful place, and one of the skeletons came up to me and babbled something. I couldn't understand him, and I held him up and held him close and said, It's all right, you're safe now, you'll be all right, only... I just don't understand you. I speak only English. I'm an American. And then he said to me, Du kennst nicht reden Mamaloschen? Bist du nicht ein Jid? And memory came surging out of my childhood. Can't you speak the mother tongue? Are you not a Jew? This I understood and was ashamed and began at that moment the long voyage home. For some on this voyage, Jew, Christian, Muslim, whatever, the guide is God. I seek the dignity and divinity in man. And in this search, one comes closer, I at least come closer, on a holy day, any holy day, so also at Christmas. I wish you well. Michael Elkins, Jerusalem.